All right, so lesson six, the country united. This is a very, very crucial uh, chapter because it really sets up the rest of Japanese history. We're at a middle point of the course of, of Japanese civilization and everything I think we can characterize to pre-lesson six and post-lesson six. So lesson six is a very, very important period for Japanese civilization. So if you might remember from last time, from lesson five, the period from 1477, which marks the end of the Onin War, to 1573 is called the Era of Warring States. And if you can see, as you can see from the map, Japan is divided up into small provinces, and each province is basically led by a daimyo warrior family. And remember, the daimyo clans were hereditary, and they were native to that province. So the Ashikaga shogun put each daimyo in control of a certain province, and they were responsible for ruling that province. The problem with this was the country is in a constant state of war because daimyo clans, who are only in it for their own province, are fighting against each other for territory and for land. So there's really no unification in the country. Japan is not unified. And the imperial family, who's still around, suffers during this period. They're still, of course, respected as divine gods, and they're technically the rulers of the land. But, you know, the palace was damaged during the Onin War. The imperial family suffers from financial difficulties during this period. In fact, one emperor's coronation had to be postponed for decades because there was no money. And the emperor had to sell his artwork uh, to get extra funds. So the imperial family was not in good financial shape. The aristocrats were miserable because, you know, in Kyoto, they didn't get involved in politics. They were very unhappy with the way the Ashikaga shoguns were ruling, but they had no power. And they also had financial difficulties. So they mainly lived in the past. They studied the literature of the Heian period, the poetry of the Heian period. You know, they read the tale of the Genji, tale of the Heike. And actually, right after the Onin War, um, many aristocrats and also Zen priests, remember Seshu the artist? They actually left Kyoto for safer provinces because Kyoto had been completely destroyed during the Onin War. A lot of the aristocrats didn't even want to live there, so they would move to other provinces and take their culture with them. So you see the provinces becoming more developed now as well because these aristocrats are leaving Kyoto for the provinces. So even though the provinces were united and daimyo warrior clans were fighting each other, this was not good for the country's unification because it wasn't unified. But the provinces were actually organized pretty well because the daimyo clan leaders, they were very, very powerful. They weren't just silly and uninterested in government like the Ashikaga shoguns. The daimyo clans actually cared about their own provinces because they were from there. Their families had grown up there for generations. They really cared about their country and their, their province. So they created legal codes in the provinces, simply for, for that province, just for that province. They organized their vassals into armies, into strong fighting units. So for the provinces, as I mentioned in chapter five, the daimyo system was great because the warrior clans really improved quality of life in their province. It was bad for the country as a whole because there's no functioning central government. And in the late 1400s and early 1500s, the daimyo developed new styles of architecture. This is where we see the birth of the Japanese castle, or oshiro in Japanese. And these were used by the daimyo clans and the samurai as the center of political administration for their province. So think about it kind of being like the, the White House for that province. This is where the daimyo lived with his family, right? This is where the daimyo ruled the province from. And it was also a place for military defense, right? Basically, if you wanted to conquer a province, you would have to take over the castle of that province because that's where the political center of the province was. That's where the daimyo family head lived with his family and with his advisors. So you can see this is a traditional castle and it's really a military, it's a fort, it's a military fortification, more than just being a residence for the daimyo leader and his family. It's also a, and more than being a political center, it's also really a fortification to protect the province from invasion. So in order to defend the castle from invasion, because as I mentioned, if the castle is taken over, that's it for your province. It gets taken over. So each castle was usually surrounded by a moat, a body of water, so that it was hard to for other enemies to invade, 
And so the greater your castle was, the bigger your castle was, the more powerful your daimyo family was. Okay, so the more powerful daimyo families had bigger, more elaborate castles. So it really represent these castles represent the power, the wealth, and the influence not only of the daimyo warrior clans, but also of the samurai class as a whole. And the way the castles were built is that they were built like mazes. Okay, so that if you were invading, if you were from a rival daimyo clan and you made it into the castle, you would basically be tricked. You would go into a room and it was a trap room or there was a trap door and you'd be tricked and you'd be attacked by, you know, the people defending the castle and, you know, you'd be defeated. So they were made to trick enemies into thinking that they were getting control of the castle, but then they walk into a trap and they're defeated. So they were, they were built like mazes. There were, you know, creaking, there were um, walls that would, you know, you couldn't hear it creaking, but then you could hear the floors creaking from another room. So you would know that someone's in the other. And there were lots of, you know, trick, trick devices used by the architects of these castles to trick enemies into thinking that they were getting into it, they were going to defeat you, but then they walk into a trap. So very, very interesting architecture too. Another element of the late Muromachi period was Japan's trade with Asia. Remember that uh, Ashikaga Yoshimitsu opens up the trade and missions to China again. So the merchant class really becomes powerful during this time and wealthy because they begin to benefit from this trade with other Asian countries. So during the Muromachi period, Japan's largest trading partners were China and Korea, uh, who were ruled by the Ming and uh, Joseon dynasties, respectively. So for the late 1400s and 1500s, Japan's trade with China and Korea really flourished. And you have market cities that are centered completely on trade in growing and, and, and developing. These are essentially called port cities. And port cities are important because they're basically built and consist completely of merchants and people who are trading. So traders come in from other countries. Merchants live there so they can trade with the traders who come in. So the economy is really good in these port cities because they're completely thriving solely on trade. Okay, and two large port cities are built during the Muromachi period. One is Sakai, which is near present-day Osaka. And this was the greatest port city in Japan during the Muromachi period because it was very close to Kyoto, the capital. And another main uh, port city is Hakata in Kyushu. This is the closest point of Japan to the Asian mainland. It's the closest city. And so it was easiest for Chinese and Korean traders to come to Hakata. Hakata is known as Fukuoka today. So what did Japan import? Uh, from China, they imported books, right? Medicine, basically anything technological is brought in from China. Copper coins and porcelain is brought in from China. From Korea, they import cotton. And what is Japan exporting out to China and Korea? Well, remember, Japan doesn't have many natural resources, so they don't really have much they can offer, but they can offer their artistic treasures. Swords, right? The samurai class develop, develops beautiful swords that are very, very highly prized folding fans, painted screens with black and white painting, right? Also sulfur from Kyushu is exported. And the merchant class is the one who is benefiting from this trade. The merchants in Japan, because of this flourishing trade with China and Korea, become very, very powerful and wealthy. Fifteen forty three, very, very important year because for the first time in Japanese history, Europeans, Westerners, arrived to Japan. And the first Westerners to arrive to Japan in fifteen forty three were the Portuguese. Portugal was a world power at this point. They were famous for trade and exploration, and they had already explored India and China, and now their sights are set on Japan. The Portuguese were excellent seafarers and they were well known for engaging in international trade at this time. So once they've explored India and China, Japan is next. So the Portuguese land on Tanegashima Island, which is right off the coast of Kyushu. Okay, so they're the first ones to arrive to Japan. And later the Spanish arrive, the Dutch from the Netherlands, the Dutch arrive, and finally the English arrive as well. So, but the Portuguese are the first. What do the Portuguese introduce to Japan? Well, they bring firearms and muskets. Okay, and this is a big turning point for the samurai because the daimyo warrior clans only knew how to use the bow and arrow until this point. 
Now they can use muskets, okay? And this is not a very good thing because keep in mind that Japan right now is not in a very good place. They're in a, they're basically civil war, okay? They're in a state of civil war. And so some daimyo clans who have access to the muskets brought by the Portuguese are able to become more powerful, right? Because muskets do a lot more damage, firearms do a lot more damage than swords, bows, and arrows, right? So more samurai, more peasants in the countryside also who get caught in the crossfire literally are killed now because firearms are able to cause a lot more damage than bows and arrows used to, okay? So if you were a daimyo clan and you had money, you wanted to get as many muskets as possible because the more muskets you had, the more of an advantage you had over other rival daimyo clans, other rival provinces who did not have access to firearms. So this is an image of, this is actually um, the Japanese image of what they perceive the Portuguese to be like. So this is the, f the first time the Japanese are seeing Westerners, right? They've only been dealing with the Chinese, the Koreans. Now they're seeing Portuguese. So this is kind of what they pictured the Portuguese as being like. And with the arrival of um, firearms uh, in 1549, Christianity arrives to Japan. Uh, Francis Xavier, he was a Portuguese Jesuit missionary, Catholic. He was sent by the Portuguese king and was on a mission to convert the Japanese to Christianity. So he was sent to do missionary work to convert as many Japanese as possible to Christianity. Um, Xavier was not, uh, he actually had a lot of great respect for the Japanese. You know, he, they did not kill anybody. They did not force anyone to convert into Christianity like what happened in South America, for example, or Central America uh, when the Spaniards arrived. It was very different because he didn't force anyone to convert. He just was spreading Christianity in a peaceful way, uh, starting in the mid-1550s. And uh, Western and Christian influence was the strongest in Kyushu. Keep in mind that Kyushu Island is the closest to the Asian mainland. This was the place where the Portuguese first landed, on Kyushu. So Kyushu had the most Western influence and Christian influence. So the majority of Christian churches built during this period in Japan were built on Kyushu because that's where the Portuguese first landed and that's where Sir Francis Xavier actually lived. So how do you think the Japanese reacted to Christianity? We know how they reacted to Buddhism during the Asuka period. It was very positive. How do you think they reacted to Christianity? Actually, in the beginning, it was very good. Uh, quite a few daimyo and samurai in Kyushu converted to Christianity. This is a big deal for a daimyo leader, a cl warrior clan head, to convert to Christianity. It was a big deal. But Christianity never really hit it off in Japan. The majority of Japanese remained Shinto and Buddhist. Um, they, and, and due to restrictions and prohibitions, Christianity just wasn't successful in Japan because the government eventually banned it. We'll see that later. But it just never really hit it off in Japan, although it was the most successful in Kyushu. The port city of Nagasaki was developed uh, in Kyushu during this period. It, it, you, you might know Nagasaki as being the second um, victim of the atomic bombing in 1945, but at this time Nagasaki was a port city, and it was the main center of Western influence. Because it was on Kyushu, it was basically where most of the Westerners landed, where most of the Europeans landed on Japan. So there were many, many Portuguese, Spanish, Dutch, and English traders who lived there and they would trade with the Japanese because it was so easily accessible from the Asian mainland. It was the closest point. Kyushu is the closest point to the Asian mainland. So many of the European traders landed there and lived there. They traded with the Japanese who lived in Nagasaki. So Nagasaki's econo economy really, really kicks off during this period. So during the mid-1500s, the Western traders and missionaries didn't really get involved with the emperor Ashikaga shogunate. They didn't try to convert anybody, you know, or try to convert the government or take over the government or, or um, conquer the government, colonize Japan. They were mainly dealing with the Kyushu daimyos, especially the ones who had converted to Christianity. At this point, all they cared about was trade and converting people to Christianity without military force or without, you know, uh, threat of execution if they didn't convert. So they mainly stayed in Kyushu, mainly in that port city of Nagasaki. They didn't really venture outside of uh, that area yet, um, and they didn't try to forcibly convert anybody either. <laughs> 